just to wrap up the workshop, I would like to kind of shift gears slightly and think about the transition from copyright law uh, to designs law and how the expansion of copyright law is posing certain sorts of challenges, um, particularly in relation to the field of fashion. Um, so my presentation is called Bring It On, the Supreme Court of the United States, Copyright Law, Designs, Fashion and 3D Printing. It's partly inspired by doing some uh, lectures with the um, fashion students in the uh, faculty of Creative Industries at QT. And it's also part of being a father of a teenage daughter and trying to get her interested in <laughs> intellectual property and technology <laughs> through the means of fashion. So there are various different um, inspirations for this particular talk. Um, so to leap straight into it, I think that fashion is kind of a particularly interesting area for intellectual property. Uh, in some ways, uh, it's an area that is very awkward in terms of the existing regimes for intellectual property and has often flourished in spite of there being limited intellectual property protection in certain sorts of ways. Um, so fashion is a very kind of interesting area because it kind of challenges some of our usual theoretical assumptions about intellectual property, that you know, strong intellectual property will necessarily lead to innovative outcomes. Um, so Chris Brickman and his uh, collaborator, uh, Carl Russitalia, wrote a really important book called The Knockoff Economy, How Imitation Sparks Innovation. And amongst other things, they kind of looked at fashion, as well as comedy and cooking and jokes, uh, a range of different areas that kind of lay outside the normal boundaries of intellectual property. And they kind of particularly interested in fashion as uh, an area that kind of cut across uh, issues in relation to form and function. And they noted IP law provides a mixed bag for the fashion industry. Trademark uh, is very significant and many apparel makers work mightily to capitalise on their brands and to cultivate an image of desirability. Echoes of Professor Petty. Um, paint law accounts for little outside of the important but limited world of accessories. Trade dress is mostly irrelevant. Copyright could be relevant, but under existing law it simply does not apply to clothing, absent a few minor exceptions such as fabric design. Um, the result is a world of powerful and valuable fashion brands, but very extensive and perfectly legal copying of fashion designs. And I guess my paper today is really about how copyright law is shifting and changing and expanding in the range of things that it protects in terms of what constitutes um, subject matter. IP Australia has kind of issued guidelines for fashionistas, kind of giving them suggestions about all the different regimes of intellectual property and how they could apply to fashion, covering copyright law, designs law, trademark law and patent law. Um, into that mix, 3D printing kind of poses some um, particular disruptive challenges in respect of the um, fashion industry and it's been kind of noticeable in terms of opportunities, some 3D printing companies have been very interested in terms of um, innovating, both in terms of the materials revolution and the appearance of 3D printing. Uh, but also there's been some very kind of particular challenges and deep anxieties and fears and concerns about copyright infringement, design infringement, um, trademark counterfeiting. Um, so I, I think 3D printing amongst other things uh, as many of the speakers have kind of gone through the many different applications of 3D printing and additive manufacturing will have a very kind of significant impact in terms of clothing, amongst other things. Um, so my presentation today is really kind of a, a, a wardrobe of various forms of fashion that have come under question in terms of battles over 3D printing. A kind of a quick recap over the battle of uh, the left shark between Katy Perry and Fernando Souza. I've kind of, kind of talked about this previously and I've written about this previously, but in some ways it's been superseded by the new Supreme Court of the United States decision in Star Athletica. Um, in this particular dispute, um, Katy Perry performed at the Super Bowl and was upstaged by one of her backup dancers. Um, who was a very uncoordinated uh, shark who couldn't um, keep up with the choreography. Left shark became something of an internet meme um, and was considered the most valuable player um, for uh, the um, Super Bowl that particular year. 
uh, a very enterprising maker called Fernando uh, Sosa. It specialised in doing political satire and parody, um, created a left shark and offered it on Shapeways. Um, Katy Perry, astute businesswoman that she is, um, had her intellectual property lawyers make a couple of claims. Uh, firstly, she kind of asserted copyright protection over left shark. And secondly, her lawyers filed a trademark um, registration application um, in relation to left shark. As luck would have it, Mr. Sosa found representation with um, Professor Crisper uh, Sprigman from New York University. And Sprigman made a couple of arguments. First of all, he questioned whether you could have copyright protection in a shark costume, um, pointing out it was a very kind of basic shape. There was not necessarily very much kind of creative effort in terms of the particular kind of shark suit. And he also kind of raised larger kind of questions about whether or not you could trademark left shark. Um, and it was interesting in terms of Katy Perry's response. She seemed, still seemed to kind of battle away, but you know, in the end she busy was selling very expensive Katy Perry left shark onesies um, on her site. Um, for its part, Shapeways, who we've heard a lot about today, um, had various different anxieties about being caught in the middle of this particular conflict between a maker um, and uh, a celebrity, uh, but you know, in the end, they kind of um, have allowed Left Shark to continue, um, and they essentially promote cooperative solutions between intellectual property owners and makers, rather than engaging in messy, uh, costly, uh, expensive litigation. It's been interesting too that Shapeways has also kind of promoted 3D printing of fashion. So, um, you know, in a particular collaboration with um, fashionistas and Dita Von Tees, they kind of designed a, a special 3D printed um, dress. Um, Shapeways kind of emphasised as we see the material properties of 3D printing mature to produce more fine, flexible materials, we will see more and more forays into fashion um, such as this. And they noted, you know, at first it is at the boundaries of high level um, fashion and art, but as we've seen with Nike using 3D printing and footwear, we'll see more and more 3D printing creep into the world of clothing and fashion until it becomes ubiquitous. Um, so that ties in a lot with some of the early presentations that we had in terms of thinking about 3D printing and Nike. The really big development this year has been the Supreme Court of the United States decision on copyright law and cheerleading costumes. Um, this particular dispute um, has brought to a head um, some of the larger kind of questions about the intersection um, between copyright law and industrial designs. Uh, and really there were kind of uh, a kind of a very vicious little battle between Varsity Brands and Star Athletica over whether or not there could be copyright protection um, in relation to cheerleading uniforms um, with stripes and chevrons and zigzags and colour blocks. And the um, Court of Appeals of the Sixth Circuit had a go at trying to resolve this dispute, but really they kind of pleaded with Congress and the Supreme Court of the United States to try to resolve an age-old kind of problem in relation to separability, um, particularly in relation to clarifying copyright law with respect to garment design. The dispute was very interesting because the 3D printing companies um, were very proactive and made submissions to the Supreme Court of the United States as friends of the court. Um, and in particular, they kind of highlighted that the dispute over copyright law and fashion raised larger significant questions um, for their um, industry. And they kind of argued the 3D printing industry has had a democratising effect on manufacturing, allowing individuals to customise designs for their own use, and greatly lowering startup costs for new entrants and markets for the design and sale of a wide variety of objects. They noted that uncertainty over the line between copyrightable and non-copyrightable works can lead to overclaiming and over of materials copyrightable. 
upsetting the balance struck by Congress between the interests of rights holders and the societal benefits from a vibrant um, public domain. The Supreme Court of the United States in some ways fell into some very old divisions on the bench and uh, you know, unlike Australia which has retirement ages for the uh, judges in the High Court of Australia, uh, for the Supreme Court of the United States you can have some very long lasting tenure of particular judges. Justice Thomas delivered the opinion of the court um, and was supported um, by four judges. Justice Ginsburg filed a concurrence. Um, Breyer filed a dissenting opinion which Kennedy joined. Thomas kind of tried to take a very kind of simple or expansive approach to copyright law. He kind of said Congress has provided copyright protection for original works of art but not for uh, industrial designs. The line between art and industrial design is often difficult to draw. Uh, the judge said, we hold that an artistic feature of the design of a useful article is eligible for copyright protection if the feature can be perceived as a two-dimensional, three-dimensional work of art separate from the useful article and would qualify as a protectable pictorial, graphic or sculptural work either on its own or in some other medium if imagined separately from the useful article. And applying that test, they found that the cheerleading uniforms could be protected under copyright law, which is quite a radical kind of outcome in many ways in terms of what potentially it could mean could be covered by the subject matter protected by copyright law. Justice Ginsburg wrote a very kind of short concurrence arguing that the designs are themselves copyrightable and pictorial or graphic works reproduced on useful articles. Uh, and I think those positions in some ways represent uh, in some ways a very kind of copyright maximalist vision in which the subject matter by copyright law is expanding and growing and can take on new subject matter either through judicial decision or through uh, the act of Congress. But then you had a kind of a stinging dissent uh, by one of the most progressive judges of the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and he was very kind of concerned that there was a need to respect previous decisions of Congress in respect of the scope of copyright protection. And he said, you know, really it's clear that Congress has not extended broad copyright protection to the fashion design industry. Um, and the judge kind of illustrated his judgment in a kind of a nice piece of law and aesthetics with various different pictures. Uh, to kind of express some of his kind of concerns about questions of separating form and function. Uh, so he had cat lamps, so he is obsessed with lamps as well. Um, he kind of talked about um, famous artworks um, and, and how they represented um, the real world in various different ways. But he also kind of talked about the artistic tradition of ready-mades. And his kind of point was that, uh, you know, many objects of design can be transferred into works of art one way or another. Uh, the judgment is a very subtle and nuanced one as well and um, you know he kind of tries to engage in his own way with some of the history of design that we heard um, earlier uh, today and we kind of talked a little bit about um, you know Frank Lloyd Wright saying form and function should be one joined in the spiritual union uh, but really he was kind of raising larger kind of concerns about the fate of copyright law. And with such an expansive approach taken to copyright law, that would also have repercussions in terms of the term of protection that was available. So copyright law in the United States is life plus 70 years, much longer period of time of protection than what is available in relation to designs law. Um, talking about the founding fathers, he was very kind of concerned um, particularly in terms of some of the discussion by Madison and others about whether copyright law would lead to the creation of um, new monopolies in the area of fashion when previously um, that was thought to be you know, outside the scope of copyright protection. So in light of such a radical development, I think there's actually a lot of scope to think about Creative Commons licensing and open licensing and open innovation. 
Um, earlier this year, Anouk Whiptrick um, visited Brisbane um, and the Myriad Innovation Festival to talk about her fashion technology, which involves the convergence between 3D printing and robotics and sensors. Uh, and she has been very much an advocate of using 3D printing, um, open innovation and digital distribution um, in relation to her works rather than being a kind of an IP maximus and trying to use various different forms of IP to protect her work. Um, she's been quite happy for others to use and adapt her work in various different ways. So she's most famous for her spider dress, uh, but she talked at Myriad about um, how um, people had done Lego recreations of her spider dress in various different ways. And she said she was ecstatic to hear that people were adopting and adapting and changing and transforming her work uh, in various different ways. And in relation to some of her other experimentations in relation to the cocktail dress, um, the smoke dress, um, and agent unicorn, she kind of has an interesting kind of mixture of using an open approach to innovation, but also entering into commercial alliances and sponsorships of one kind or another with Intel and various other manufacturers. Um, and her most recent kind of work um, is, is very kind of maker focused. So she attends maker fairs and encourages individuals to make their own work. Um, so just to wrap up, I think there's a real kind of larger questions about where fashion fits within intellectual property. Is it best suited under designs law or copyright law or trademark law? Some argue that there should be some sort of specialist regime in relation to intellectual property. Um, so the Fashion Council, um, heroic uh, designers have argued that there needs to be special protection um, in relation to intellectual property and fashion. I guess my kind of disquiet would be in conclusion that you know, many of the 3D printing um, companies have been kind of concerned about the push towards heightened protection um, in relation to uh, fashion in various different ways. So Mike Weinberg from Shapeways um, has expressed concerns about the enlargement of the subject matter protected by copyright law and how that might impact the creative activity of uh, makers, uh, the work of intermediary sites like Shapeways and Thingiverse, uh, but also businesses based upon that model. Um, so to finish up, Cal and Chris Brickman in the knockoff economy note that fashion is a huge industry um, and it, it kind of disrupts our conventional view of innovation that tells us that widespread copying destroys creativity and kills markets. Uh, they kind of note that certain kind of creative fields rely upon imitation and repetition and recycling in various different ways. And I think 3D printing um, will only accelerate that trend. And that's all for me. Given the time, I think we're probably going to need to wrap up then, but I'm sure all the various speakers are more than happy to email or have a chat to uh, individuals in the audience who've um, uh, listened to them. Hopefully this event today will be the beginning of future um, activities and uh, relating to 3D printing regulation, and we're very kind of keen to take a collaborative networked approach to looking at 3D printing regulation um, involving a wide range of different lawyers, uh, those kind of involved in uh, the creative arts and design and industry, uh, but we're also very kind of interested in some of the commercial applications of the field as well. So, and we're very kind of glad that we we're able to start with designs law as a much neglected kind of area. So, thank you very much to the speakers and thank you very much to the audience.